Well, I'm Danny Levin, senior pastor here at Calvary, and earlier this year, the other pastors at Calvary and I went to a conference. It was put on by the Gospel Coalition, and the theme of the conference was the new heavens and the new earth. And we, we enjoyed the conference a lot, and I remember a particular illustration that one of the speakers shared, and in this illustration or story, he told us to imagine a hypothetical person in our congregation, and he called this person Secular Sam. And he said, secular Sam is a person who's in your congregation. They're probably a believer in Jesus. They're probably very active. They probably read their Bible and pray. They may even be a leader, a significant leader in your congregation. But secular Sam only thinks about his faith in the context of the world right in front of him. He doesn't uh, think about how the world is going to be different, that Christ will return to it, and he doesn't think about the implications that has for his life, the implications of Jesus' return. And while the pastor was talking, one thing came to my mind, one sentence, and it's this, I am secular Sam. I'm exactly who he's talking about. Because, yeah, I'm very active in my faith. I'm even a leader in my church. And, and, I'm, and I'm very committed to following Christ. But I don't think about Christ's return very often at all. And often, because I don't think about it, I don't live in light of it. And I don't think it's just me. I think a lot of us struggle with this. And it's a problem. And here's why. This secular Sam mentality, it has consequences for the way that we live. Uh, it can, first of all, it can give us apathy and cause us to be weighed down with things of this world because we're not thinking about the hope that we have in Jesus' uh, return. It can also cause us to give in to cultural pressure, and it can also just cause, cause us to give up whenever things are difficult. And so what we need is to get rid of this secular Sam outlook mentality, and we need to remember that Jesus is coming back and to have that on our minds consistently and to live in light of that. And so in order to challenge us to do that, we're coming to our passage today, Luke chapter 21, verses 5 through 38. And this passage specifically challenges us to be watchful for Jesus' return. Now, by, by, by saying to be watchful, what I'm not saying is that we go outside, we look at the sky, and we think, okay, are you coming now? Are you coming now? No, that's not what I mean. And, and, and being watchful also does not mean that we've got our current events news on and we're comparing that with what we see in the Bible to try to figure out the exact time that Jesus is coming back. No, that's not the watchfulness that this passage is talking about. The watchfulness this passage calls for is that we know that he's coming back and that we live appropriately in light of that. We know we're certain of his return and that we live in light of that. And so here's the outline of our passage today. Luke 21, 5 to 38. We're first going to see Jesus predict the upcoming destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And then he will predict his return. And he'll talk about the certainty of it. And then finally, the passage concludes with a response or an application Jesus calls his disciples to watchfulness. And so we'll talk about how that's our response as well, that we're to be watchful for Jesus' return. And then we'll talk about some specific ways that looks in our lives. So if you will, turn, if you haven't yet, to Luke chapter 21. And I'm going to begin reading um, in verse 5. And we're going to look first at how Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. And while some in verse 5 were speaking of the temple... How it was adorned with noble stones and offerings. He, Jesus, said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. All right, so the topic of conversation here is the temple. And just so you understand, the temple was a centerpiece of Jewish. Uh, religion and Jewish culture. It was where God's presence dwelled. It was where the sacrifices and the festivals had a uh, center uh, there. And so uh, it had all that significance. And what, what's more, it was beautiful. Uh, the temple Jesus is referring to was the second temple. The first temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians about 500 years before. Um, it had been rebuilt not too long after that. And now at this point, during Jesus's day, it was being refurbished so that it was known for its beauty around uh, the, the region. And, but Jesus looks at it and he says, look, 
there will be a time when it's going to be destroyed. It's going to be gone. And when he says it's going to be destroyed, he's not just talking about how it's going to be worn down over time, you know, clinging to life in disrepair, you know, kind of like that building in downtown Nina near the water that just won't go down, you know, it's just clinging to life. I'm ready for that thing to go down. I mean, but uh, <clears throat> that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's, he's talking about a violent, sudden, total destruction that's going to happen quickly. And it's a, it's a bold prediction. And it, and it reminds me a little bit of, I was thinking about this passage, and it reminded me of when um, I was younger, our family got a pool table. And, and I remember when we first got it, we were horrible. I mean, we were, we, were, we were shooting, we were trying to get the balls to go in the pockets, and we, we couldn't do it. But after a while, after we practiced a bunch, we got to the point where we could call our shot, where we could say, six ball, side pocket. Now, I couldn't make it every time, but I could at least hit the six ball and point it in that general direction uh, enough so I could call my shot. Well, that's kind of what Jesus is doing here. He's calling his shot. But listen, it's a much bigger deal because we're not talking about a pool table. We're talking about human history, okay? And Jesus is saying that this temple that you see in front of you, it's going to be destroyed. And you know what? He was right. Almost 40 years or around 40 years later, the temple was completely destroyed by a Roman army. And Jesus here, several years before it happens, is predicting that it's going to happen. And the disciples hear this and they want to hear more. Look at verse 7. They ask him, teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? All right. So the disciples ask him to say more. And now in verses 8 to 24, Jesus is going to answer their question in three ways. He's first going to talk about the signs that are going to happen, things that are going to happen before the temple is destroyed. Then in verses 12 to 19, he's going to talk about what the disciples are going to have to go through during that time, specifically persecution. And then finally, he talks a little bit more about the details of Jerusalem's destruction and the temple's destruction. And so first, let's look at Jesus describe the signs that will precede the destruction of the temple. Verse 8, and he said, see that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famine or famines and pestilences. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. All right, so Jesus is warning his disciples of the events that are leading up to the destruction of the, uh, the temple that would happen in, in, in 70 AD, just a, a little while later. And he talks about how during that time, false messiahs are going to come and, and don't follow them. And then he says, there's going to be conflict, there's going to be war, there are going to be earthquakes, natural disasters, things like that happening. And you know what? We can look back at history in the first century and we can see that Jesus was right. This was a time of chaos uh, in the area of Judea and in the Roman Empire at this time. And, and Jesus saw that coming and he wanted to warn his disciples about it. But I also want you to note back in verse 9 how Jesus says this will not be the end, meaning that this will not this is not my second coming that I'm describing. Jesus is actually going to talk about that a little bit later in the passage, but he wants the disciples to understand that he's right now describing to them the destruction of the temple that's going to be happening just a few years later. He wants them to be clear about that. And so now that Jesus has described the events leading up to that, he is now going to make it more personal. And he's going to tell the disciples what they are going to have to go through, namely, they're going to be persecuted. So let's read verses 12 to 19. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be, will be able to withstand or contradict." You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. So 
Leading up to Jerusalem and the temple's destruction, uh, the disciples are going to face some intense persecution. In fact, Jesus tells them that some of them are going to lose their lives. And you know what? If you read the book of Acts, you see this. The, The disciples face intense persecution, and some of them die. But note, Jesus also tells them that he is going to be with them, to provide for them. He says, I'll give you a mouth. In other words, I'll give you the words to say. I'll give you wisdom. And so Jesus says, I'll be with you in that time, and it will be an opportunity for you to witness and again, if we read the book of Acts, we see that happening. They, they bear witness constantly in their hearings and in their trials uh, of who Jesus is and eternal life and Jesus' resurrection uh, and all that that is offered in Christ. Uh, Jesus also promises here that he's going to preserve his disciples. Even those who die, they will not be totally destroyed because they will be with Christ forever. And then finally, Jesus tells them specifically that this persecution is an opportunity for them to endure and to bear witness of him. And, and it's, really, it's really powerful here. Jesus' pastoral concern for his disciples, isn't it? I mean, he knows what's coming. And he wants to make sure his disciples know that they're going to face some tough stuff. I mean, he, he doesn't pull any punches here. He tells them exactly what's coming. But then he also comforts them and tells them that in that difficulty, I'll be with you and I'll give you everything you need to face it. And now... What Jesus is going to do, now that he's talked to his disciples about the signs that are happening before the temple's destruction, he's told them what they're going to go through, now he's going to talk about the destruction of the temple itself, and he's going to talk about how it involves not just the temple, but the whole city of Jerusalem. Let's take a look at 20 to 24. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it, for these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until, all, uh, or until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Okay, it's clear here that Jesus is talking about a military attack on Jerusalem because he's talking about how armies are going to surround the city. Uh, again, remember, Jesus is speaking about 40 years in advance of this happening, and he is describing accurately what takes place. Because we know from history what happens is that the Jews revolt against the Romans, and the Romans send Titus uh, along with his army to come, and, and they wipe out Jerusalem. They destroy the temple, just as it is described here. And Jesus wants people to understand that when these armies come, run away. This is not the time to stand and be courageous and fight. You'll lose The Romans are going to win. You need to get out of town and don't enter the city. And and it's interesting that he even makes this statement about uh, pregnant and nursing women. Um, Have you ever tried to rush a pregnant woman? It doesn't work. Uh, Or a nursing woman. It doesn't work. I mean, you just can't do that. But what Jesus is saying here is that circumstances are so dire that everyone, even those in situations like that, are going to have to get out of town fast for the sake of their own lives. And then he notes that the reason that this destruction is happening is because the Jewish leadership has rebelled against God. They have led God's people in a corrupt way, using their positions of leadership for themselves instead of serving others and loving others. And they have, and perhaps this is their worst sin, they have rejected God's son, Jesus. And so because of that, they are going to face this great destruction. So do you see, big picture, what's happening here in Luke 21, verses 5 to 24. Jesus is calling his shot. He is saying that the temple is going to be destroyed, and he is doing that to, first of all, demonstrate his his divine knowledge, his sovereignty, his power, but he's also doing it to to let Jerusalem, to let the people know that that they are facing destruction because of their rejection of him, and then finally, to to tell his disciples what is happening so that they can be prepared. Well, now, in the next section, verses 25 to 28, Jesus is going to go a step further. He's going to call another shot. And he is going to predict not only 
the judgment of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, but he is going to now predict his second coming and his judgment of the whole world. And so let's read verses 25 to 28. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the seas and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. All right, so there's clearly an even greater distress before Jesus has his second coming, before he returns. In fact, creation itself is signaling his return through these cosmic signs. And then in 27 and 28, we see Jesus predict his actual return. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Now, verse 27, to the ears of a first century person, I mean, you hear hear those words and your mouth would drop. You would be riveted by what Jesus said because what he's doing is he is clearly alluding to a very significant passage in the Old Testament when he calls himself the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And the passage is Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And in that passage, there's this vision that Daniel has, and it's a vision where great earthly kingdoms are described. And then there's this figure, one like a son of man, who comes before the Ancient of Days, before the Lord, to receive God's authority and power. In fact, let's read the passage. It's Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I was watching in the night visions... And with the clouds of the sky, one like a son of man was approaching. He went up to the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. To him was given ruling authority, honor, and sovereignty. All peoples, nations, and language groups were serving him. His authority is eternal and will not pass away. His kingdom will not be destroyed. Now, with that background... Do you see why the people of the first century would have been shocked by what Jesus says? He's applying that passage to himself. And what Jesus is saying is, I am that son of man. I am that one who receives from the Lord power and authority over all nations forever. That's what Jesus is claiming here. And this is why, if you look back in Luke 21 verse 28, Jesus' disciples can be encouraged Because because they're followers of his, they know that when Jesus comes, he comes to reign over all. And that means that their redemption has come as well. Now, before we move on to the next section, I want to ask and answer a really important question. And it's this. Remember back in verse 7, when Jesus, 5 and 6, Jesus said, this temple is going to be destroyed. Verse 7, the disciples asked, when will these things take place? So Jesus gives this answer. Now, my question is, why would Jesus, in answering a question about when the temple will be destroyed, does he talk about his second coming? Why is that a part of the answer? Well, here's why, and you can't miss this. Jesus is connecting these two events. He is saying that just as I will bring judgment on Israel for their rejection of me in 70 AD by having the temple destroyed by the Romans, so... I will bring worldwide judgment on those who have rejected me when I return. And and the certainty of both things is also significant. Don't miss that. Because Jesus is saying, just as the first event, the destruction of the temple, is sure, so the second event, my return, is sure. If the one happens, and by the way, we know that it did, then that means it is certain that the second will happen. Jesus will return. And doesn't this confront our whole secular Sam mindset and mentality? I mean, what excuse do we have to not believe in, to not be thinking about Jesus' second coming? It is absolutely sure. Jesus is calling his shots here, and he was dead on on the first one. He is going to be right on the second one. And if connecting Jesus' second coming with what happened in AD 70 is not enough, take a look at verses 29 to 33 where we see Jesus talk even more about the certainty of his return. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. 
As soon as they come out in leaf, you see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Jesus says, you're going to see this stuff coming. And that's true of the destruction of Jerusalem. He told them the signs that were going to happen. It's true of his return as well. It's certain. And then in verse 32, he says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Now, Bible readers puzzle over this verse because Jesus says no, this generation is not going to pass away until all this has taken place. And so I mean, our first question is, well, Jesus hasn't returned yet. And all those people who were alive when he said this have passed away. And so how does this work? Well, there are at least a couple of good ways to understand what Jesus is saying here. Uh, the first way is that by this generation in verse 32, Jesus is indeed referring to those who are listening to him, his disciples uh, and, and those who are there with him. And by these events, all these things taking place, Jesus is referring to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which indeed did take place in many of their lifetimes. Now, that's one way to understand it. Another way to understand it is that by this generation, Jesus is referring to those who will be alive right before his return this generation who will see the beginnings of the signs of his return. And he says Jesus' return will happen shortly after that so that they will not die before that happens. Now, either of these ways of understanding it works. I tend to lean toward the first understanding uh, just because it was his immediate audience and because the destruction of the Jerusalem is essentially connected to the event of his second coming. Jesus has made that connection. But really, either interpretation works Whatever one you choose, the whole point is the same. And the point is this. Jesus is saying, I will return. <laughs> I'm coming back, and it's sure. And verse 33 really drives that point home. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In other words, creation is less permanent than the sh sureness of Jesus' return. Then finally, our passage concludes with Jesus making an application to his followers, and it certainly applies to us. He calls his disciples to watchfulness. Verse 34, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. And every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged on the mount called Olivet. And early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. So Jesus brings all this together into, a, uh, into an application. He says, be watchful. And again, not in the sense where we're staring up at the sky, just waiting, not in the sense that we're trying to figure out the dates, watchful in the sense that we are sure of his return and that we're living in light of that. And then Jesus says specifically here that part of that means that we are not to be weighed down with the cares of this life because this life is going to pass away. This world is not going to be like it is right now forever. Jesus is going to come back and therefore live in light of that. Be watchful. Stay awake and pray. Be ready to stand when he returns. And this last section, this application, this exhortation leads us right to our response from this passage. We are to be watchful. In light of Jesus' return, we are to be watchful for his return. And as I mentioned in the beginning, that involves two things. It involves us knowing that he's coming back and then living in light of that, living appropriately in light of that. So let me talk about each of those things briefly uh, for just a moment. Uh, first of all, know that he's coming back. Now, we can talk about that at a couple of levels. I mean, at one level, all of us, you know, if I gave all of you a theology quiz, and one of the questions was, is Jesus coming back? Yes, no. I think all of you would get it right, okay? Yes, okay? So I, I don't think there's an issue at that level. There's a, there's a deeper way to know something. In other words, we know it, and it's a part of our thinking. It's something we regularly reflect on, and it affects the way that we live. And, and that's the kind of knowing that I'm talking about, that we don't have this secular Sam mentality where we're only thinking about life right in front of us. 
We're thinking about Christ and that he will certainly return. And so one of the things I'd encourage you to do, challenge you to do, in light of this passage this week, is to take some time and intentionally think about the fact that Christ is coming back. Think about it. And there are a lot of different ways you can do it. I'll tell you, one of the ways I've been doing it over the past few weeks is I I like to go on walks. And so sometimes I'll just turn off my music, I'll just turn off everything, and I'll just think about Christ coming back. And I'll look around and I'll think, well, this world is not always going to be this way. One day Christ will rule on the earth and I'll be there with him. And so just intentionally spending some time thinking about that. And you can do that in that way by going on a walk or something. You can do it by reading scripture because certainly the the Bible testifies of this. You can reread our passage from today or you can go to a passage like Revelation 19 and the end of the book of Revelation. Just do something this week to get it on your mind, the return of Christ. Jesus has called us to stay awake, to believe that he's coming back. And so let's respond by by doing that. And then secondly, let's live appropriately in light of his return. In other words, knowing that he's coming back is not just an intellectual exercise. It makes a a difference in our lives. And I'll tell you, one very practical way this looks, probably the foundational practical way this looks, is that we are to receive salvation in Jesus. Listen, what's what's very clear from this passage, very clear, is that Jesus is coming back. That's not in question. It's going to happen. And when he comes back, there are going to be two groups of people. There's going to be the first group, that group that has repented and trusted in him to be their savior. That group uh, will be with him. They will reign with him forever. And then there will be a second group And that second group has not trusted in Christ, and they will be separated from him, and they will be in torment forever. You want to be in that first group. And so how do you do that? I mean, that's the most practical response, is is that you want to be in that first group. Well, how do you do it? Well, you repent and believe in Jesus as your Savior. By repent, what I simply mean is that you acknowledge that you are a sinner, that you have not lived the holy life that God has called you to live, that you have fallen short of of his holiness, and that you uh, rightly deserve a punishment forever, and that you can't do anything about it. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. No way you can turn it around. That's repentance. It's, It's giving up on my efforts to get to God, and then it's trusting in Jesus's work for you. It's putting your faith in what he did for you. Because when Jesus died on the cross, what he was doing is he was taking the punishment for sin that you and I deserved. And then God raised him from the dead. And now, because Jesus did that, we now have the opportunity to have our sins forgiven by trusting in him. He takes our punishment that we deserve and he gives us his righteousness and we can be forgiven and loved by God and accepted by him in the true sense. And so if you have never done that, then that's your response to this passage. Repent and believe in Jesus. Receive salvation in him. And if you have questions about it, please come and talk to me afterwards about what it means to do that. Now, if you are a follower of Christ already, let me talk about two more specific ways that you can live in light of Jesus' return. And one of those ways is, and I'll take the language right out of Luke, don't be weighed down by the cares of this life. And when I use that language, and when Jesus used that language, I mean, one of the things that might come to your mind is um, that maybe Jesus is talking about not being weighed down by greed. In other words, not being materialistic and owning too many things. And and, and that's certainly something that can prevent us from living in light of Jesus' return. But, But often it can be the more subtle things that can do just as much or even more harm And one of the things that I was thinking of this week as I was thinking about this passage is that often we can be weighed down by the cultural pressure that we feel. And specifically, I was thinking about the cultural pressure to be tolerant, that that we should allow people to just believe whatever they want to believe, and we we don't have to say anything about it. They can just believe what they want. Tolerance, that is a very high value in our culture, and it runs directly against what the Bible says about how salvation, there is only one name under heaven by which we can be saved, and that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So we often face that kind of cultural pressure, and you know what it can do? It can cause disastrous consequences in our lives. 
if we give in to that cultural pressure. It can cause us to be embarrassed about our faith. You know, if, I, if I'm a Christian and I, I'm not tolerant, then, then maybe I don't even want to admit that I'm a Christian because other people will look at me as this intolerant person and they won't like me. That's one response we could have. Another response we could have is we could begin to compromise our faith. We could begin to start to accept, yeah, sure, okay, maybe that would work for you, and so that's good enough for you. And we would be hesitant to even share our faith with others because, again, we don't want to be perceived as intolerant. That cultural pressure that we can feel is very strong, and and it's a serious threat to our faith and to the mission that Jesus has called us to, to be his witnesses. But here's what we have to do. We have to remember that Jesus is coming back and that when he comes back, he is going to judge those who have not put their hope, their trust in him, as we talked about earlier. And and what that means is that we have to to, to do Jesus' mission. We have to share that message, share the good news of what Jesus has done for others with the people that God has put in our lives. We're to be bold about our faith, being honest about our commitment to Christ, saying, yes, I am a Christian. We are to not allow any other gospel to get into our beliefs so that we would be tolerant and to do those kinds of things. Now, listen, that doesn't mean we can't be loving. Of course we're going to be loving. Of course we're going to have meaningful back and forth dialogue with people. That's not what I'm saying. Don't go bash people. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that we hold tightly to our faith and we don't compromise on that. We can do that through his strength that he gives us. And then we are to graciously, humbly, and boldly witness Jesus to the people that God has put in our lives. And we do it by his strength in us. And that really leads us right to the the third way we can practically live in light of his return, and that is we witness Jesus. Remember in the passage, Jesus told his disciples that you're going to face persecution, but it's going to be an opportunity for you to witness. And I'm going to give you strength to do it. Well, that same opportunity is ours. In light of the cultural pressure that we face, God has given us his spirit, his very presence in us to strengthen us, to do Jesus' mission, to witness Jesus to others. And so pray for God to give you opportunities to do that. I mean, Peg shared shared a great story about how God gave her an opportunity and by his strength, by his grace, she took it and God is at work in the life of that woman. Pray for God to give you those kinds of opportunities. And then when they come, take them. Trust that God will give you the words to say, that he will give you the strength, and that he will work in the lives of those people because he's the one who draws people to himself anyway. Well, in conclusion, it is my prayer in response to this passage that we will be secular Sams no more. (laughs) That we will believe and hold on to tightly the hope that Jesus is coming back. It is, we know it's going to happen. Jesus guarantees it. What happened in 70 AD guarantees it. It's going to happen. So let's believe that. Hold fast to it and live in light of it, doing the mission that God has called us to do. Stand with me, if you will, and let's pray, and we'll conclude with a song of response. Father, we humbly repent of our apathy and our forgetting about your kingdom. We confess being weighed down by the things of this world. We confess giving in to pressure. God, we repent. And we as a church ask that you Well, first of all, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you love us even in the midst of our failure. And we thank you that you are at work in us. And we thank you for the hope that we have in that. And so we pray that you will give us the grace to do this mission that you've called us to. Give us the strength to remember you're coming back and to live in light of it. And we pray this and we sing and celebrate you in Christ's name. Amen.